Good morning again, John chapter 10. Spoiler alert for our John study, we're jumping ahead a little bit. John chapter 10, verse 1 through 11. It's the last message in our spring Welcome to New Life series. As we've been looking at spring, how spring echoes the hope that is to come. Hope is not found in a life circumstance. It's not found by getting a new job. It's not found by getting that long-weighted pay raise. It's not found by purchasing a new vehicle, a new home. Hope is not a what. Hope is a who. Because hope is Jesus. And Jesus alone. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the sheep, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. And then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you. Lord, for your word this morning. We thank you for the truths that are proclaimed of who you are. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you lead us that you guide us, that you don't leave us alone. God, in this moment, this morning, we pray that your spirit, Lord, would move in this place, that you would teach us, grow us, expand our faith, not because of who we are or anything that we have done, but because of who you are. The songs that we've sung this morning that proclaim your love and your greatness and your glory and your holiness. Lord, everything that is done this morning is done for you. Lord, we pray that you would receive the glory and the honor that you so rightly deserve. Lord, we love you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've been speaking on the beauties of spring 
the songs that we hear, the flowers, the new life, those are just merely shadows and echoes of the great hope that is to come. The great hope that we can have today in the person of Jesus Christ. On Wednesday nights, we've started a new study on being a disciple. And what a disciple is. And a disciple is one who identifies with Jesus, who finds their identity in Him. That we do not belong to this world. That we are a child of God. That we are an ambassador for Christ. We are pilgrims and strangers traveling through this world Sheep in need of a shepherd. In this passage this morning, we'll see that there's no greater shepherd to follow this pilgrimage and this pathway that we walk through than Jesus. John chapter 10, look back in verse 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now this conversation, because we're kind of out of, we've been going verse by verse through John. We kind of jumped forward in John. So we're eventually going to get back and we'll connect those pieces into the context of this in a greater way here in the coming months. But for now, the context that is important to us is that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. In the chapter before, he healed the blind man. But the Pharisees did not believe in the power of what Jesus had just accomplished. They did not believe in who he was. They did not believe in what he was saying. And so he turns his attention to the Pharisees and he begins building an incredible illustration for them. Now, when I'm thinking of these the sheep in the sheepfold, for some reason, my mind, I don't know, I, I know there's sheep in other places than Ireland, right? But for some reason, Ireland comes into my mind because it's very green. And so in my mind, I picture this, this Irish countryside, green pastures and hills, long roads. And then in the middle of this are these walls, these, the big rock walls. You ever seen a movie when they pictured it? I've never been there. I'd love to go to Ireland one day. But they have these, you know, the rock walls, these giant rocks that are just stacked on top of each other. And they go around and they form this giant pin that these sheep would go into. And as the sheep are led into this pin, Jesus is giving the illustration that it, Somebody that wants to take advantage or kill or eat or destroy or capture these sheep doesn't go through the front door. What they're going to do, these thieves and these robbers, are they're going to come around the side and they're going to climb over these giant rocks into the pen to get these sheep. Now, what they're not realizing is, and what they're not understanding is, is that Jesus is calling them these thieves and robbers. There's echoes of a vain religion that the Pharisees are living out. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. It is important for us As we look through this, as Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he's calling them out on their vain religion, that we take warning of other places in Scripture that echo vain religion. See, the Pharisees here, they don't see themselves for who they are. They're deceiving themselves. They're so inward-focused, so self-centered, that they are not seeing and hearing the very words of Jesus who is speaking to them. They are so so blinded by their inner selfishness. James 1, 22, we see an echo of vain religion. 
It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is what? Vain. Does anybody want to have vain religion? To live in vanity, where it means nothing. Pure religion, in verse 27 of James chapter 1, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. There's a humility there that true religion has, that true belief has, to put others before yourself. Those who need help, the fatherless, the widows, they need love, they need care. It makes you turn your eyes from yourself and to look out to those that are hurting. It's humility and keeping himself unspotted from the world. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Matthew 7, verse 3. It says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly <coughs> Excuse me. to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Again, vain religion is always focused on what others are doing. Oh, did you see what he did? It takes humility to turn inwards. <laughs> To do real self-examination. Could you give me some water, please? Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is warning the Pharisees here. He's trying them to get them to wake up. Don't be like that. Scripture echoes for us as believers. So many warnings. Hey, don't look like that. <laughs> Don't do that. Be humble. Focus inward. Thank you. What are they lacking? What are the Pharisees lacking? Turn to John 13, 35. John 13, 35. One thing that defines us, one thing that should define us, and one thing that definitely defines Jesus. One thing that should define every disciple of Christ. How does the world know that we are followers of Jesus? How do they know? John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And when you look back at James, what we just looked at, and when you looked at Matthew, the one thing that was lacking in all of that was love. If you truly love someone, it will define your actions, it will define your words, it will drive who you are. Matthew twenty two thirty six. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said un, 
to him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, what is defining of a follower of Christ? What is it? Love. First John 4.19 How can we love? We love Him and in turn others because what? He first loved us. We have the example of love in Jesus. And He's trying to point out to the Pharisees back in there that your, 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 your motive is wrong. You're lacking love. You're focused too much on yourself and what you want that you're missing love for others. You're trying to kill, steal, destroy when you should be trying to love, to care, to build up. He's trying to get them to focus on that. The question, and this is our first application, it's coming early. The question that we need to look at in ourselves is truly, do you love? Do I love? Do I love others? And we might say, well, have you seen what that person does? (laughs) Did you hear what he said to me? I found a quote this week that I thought was really cool. It says, love is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. Let me say it again. I wish these were my words, but they're not. It says, love is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. We are called to love. And love springs from the hope that we have in Jesus. The Pharisees here were so self-centered because what does the thief do? What does a thief do? Steals. He takes what's not his, right? Doesn't work for it. Doesn't earn it. He comes in and he takes what is not his. And what does that do to the person that he takes from? Brings hurt, right? You feel violated if somebody breaks into your home or breaks into your car and takes something that you've worked for, that you've cared for. The thief and the robber and the Pharisee in this story is completely opposite from what Jesus calls the disciple to be. And that is what he is trying to teach them here. He says, you're coming in to destroy. You're coming in to harm. But those that truly follow me will be defined by what? Love. That's how the world will know we know Jesus when we have love one to another. That's just my first application point. Four or five more to go. Turn with me back to John chapter 10. The Pharisees can't, they have a wrong spiritual understanding. At the base is fundamentally wrong of what they believe They show they don't care for the Lord's flock, the sheep of his pasture. They're only trying to indulge their selfish greed, even if that means stealing and killing sheep. Verse 2, but it says, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He's saying the shepherd's going to enter the right way. A door is meant to walk through, right? Right? Walls aren't meant to be walked through or climbed over. He's saying the shepherd will go through the door. 
He doesn't need to sneak around. He doesn't need to deceive. He doesn't need to use intimidation or convince others that things that are good aren't good. Verse 3, to him the porter or the gatekeeper openeth. So when the true shepherd is there, he is recognized. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. There's so much truth right there in hope for the believer. If you're underlining, in verse 3 it says, and he calleth his own sheep. Underline calleth. He calleth them by what? By name. So what does that mean? That the shepherd knows the name of the sheep. And then what does he do? He leads them. Underline leadeth. What do we do when we find promises? Claim them. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your hope is in that he knows your name. You are not unknown to Jesus. Does it, does it feel good to be forgotten? No. <laughs> it feels good to be known. And it feels better to be known by the one who came to die for us. So we're going to claim the promise that he knows my name. Are you ready? So we're going to say, Jesus knows my name. Ready? Three people are ready. <laughs> are we ready? Yeah. All right, this is hope. This is joy. Jesus knows your name. Are we ready? Let's claim it. Jesus knows my name. Do you believe that? Let's do it again. Jesus knows my name. What hope is in that? And what was the other promise? He leads me. My shepherd knows me. And he leads me. He guides me. So the second truth we're going to claim is that Jesus leads me. And if you want to put your name in there, it might be awkward talking in third person. I realized that the other day when I was like, why are we talking in third person when we do this? Jesus leads me. Ready? Three people. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Amen. Jesus leads me. Let's do it again. Jesus leads me. He knows me. He leads me. That is the hope the good shepherd brings to us. The sheep willingly follow him. Why? Because they trust him. They know that the shepherd wants good for them. That's Romans 8.28 that we looked at, that all things work together for good to him, to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. We looked at that verse a couple weeks ago. They hear his voice. They know his voice. Look at verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. He is leading us. And the sheep follow him, they trust him, for they know his voice. I love it when we go, now that school is actually happening again, is an awesome thing, it's awesome for the kids, it's changed the kids. Being in an environment where they can be social and they're structured has been so good for our own kids. But when you go to pick them up is, is the coolest thing because you have so many kids and they say the last name of the kid or the parent says their name, and what does the kid do? Runs. He recognizes the voice of somebody that they trust, somebody that they love. When we hear Jesus' voice, it is the same thing. We know we can trust him, 
and we turn to him and we run to him because he goes before us. He's walked the path that we have walked. He knows what we're going to encounter. And he's going to be there for us every step of the way. That is the hope that Jesus brings. Verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. They're not familiar with other voices. If a stranger comes up to a child and calls them, usually there's a, a hesitancy, or we teach, try to teach our children to have a hesitancy because that might be a person that you cannot trust. You don't know the voice. Verse 6, it says, The parable, this parable, Jesus spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't understand. Why? Because they didn't believe. They had already shown their unbelief. They didn't believe in the power that healed. They didn't believe in the words that he said of who he was. To stand face to face with Jesus, I can't imagine what an experience that would have been. Easy for us to say who believe now, but in the moments of those who didn't believe, seeing the works of God in a physical way as God healed people right in front of them, as he revealed his power. But you know, God does that to us every single day. He reveals his power to us. Amen or no? Does God reveal his power to you? Who took a, a breath this morning? <laughs> Hopefully everybody. The power of God in giving life, in sustaining life. Every breath that you take is evidence that God exists. That God cares for you. It shows his power. Verse 7. Jesus takes another run at explaining things to them. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Before he was saying, I'm the shepherd. He's taking it further. He's saying, I am the door. He is the entrance. He is the way. He is the way in. Verse 8, it says, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. He's referring to abusive leaders, kings of the Old Testament, other false prophets who led people astray and didn't follow the way that God has intended. Verse 8, But the sheep did not hear them. In verse 9, again, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what? Saved. He's saying salvation is through me. I am the way. I am hope. I am life. I am salvation. It is me. And he goes even further. He says they shall go in and out and find pasture. When a sheep goes out to pasture, what is he looking for? Food. Water, nourishment. He's looking for his life to be sustained. When we enter Jesus, we go to him for the nourishment that our souls need to be sustained. They go in and out and find pasture in Jesus. We find pasture, we find safety. Verse 10, it says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what the thief wants to do. Kill, steal, 
destroy. He wants to bring about as much destruction as he possibly can. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to tear you down. He wants you to believe things that are not true. He wants you to follow ways that are not his. And he's already told us there's only one way. He told us what the door is. Life, hope, salvation is only found in Jesus. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But why does he come? Why does the good shepherd come? He says, I am come that they might have life. And not just regular life, not just any old life. But it continues and says, and that they might have it more abundantly. So there's another promise that we see in Scripture that when we go to Jesus, we will not just have life, but we will have abundant life. So we're going to claim another promise, making sure you're still with me. Still here? Yes. So we're going to say, in, this is going to be a long one, in Jesus, I, because we're making it personal, have abundant life. Are we ready? In Jesus, I have abundant life. Do you believe it? Then claim it. Jesus is there for you. Not just to give you life, but to give you abundant life. Let's claim it again. In Jesus, I have abundant life. It is true. It is a promise. It is from your Savior. It is from the Good Shepherd And all of it is, in verse 11, look in verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus came to this earth, lived a life without sin, died on the cross and shed his blood, and rose from the dead. He took our punishment on him on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and provided a way that we can be saved. This is the shepherd, the good shepherd, not just a shepherd, but the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John 15, 13, it says, No greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. Turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Love is modeled to us by Jesus as we go back to that idea of love. No greater love than for one to give their life for another. That they may live and not just have life, but to have life abundant. And all of this Lamentations 3.22 these, these, these are some of the verses that I use probably every single day. When life seems overwhelming, when life seems hard and difficult and, 
impossible to understand. The love of God is seen in Lamentations 3.22, that he will not leave us, that he will lead us. It says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It is God's love towards us that that thief and that robber that is seeking destruction does not find us and destroy us. It is God's love and his mercies. It says because his compassions fail not, his love endures forever. It is never ending. Verse 23. And they are new every morning. Every morning. Does it say it's new on Sundays? It's new on the third of every month? It's new on the first of every month when you have to pay your mortgage payment? Because that's when we need, we need mercies? No. Every morning. That first breath you take, your eyes pop open and you see the sunshine or you wake up before the sunshine. We are guaranteed that we receive new mercies. That is hope. And when we try to pile on the weight of tomorrow on to today and it overcomes us and we're overwhelmed, why is that? Because I don't have the mercies for tomorrow. I don't have the mercies for next week. I have the mercies for today. And I'm going to live today for today. And I'm going to live today in its fullest. And I know I'm going to have all the mercies that I need to get through today. And I'm going to trust that whatever comes tomorrow, He's going to give me the mercies to walk that day. And so we don't pile the weight of the future on our back. We don't put those burdens on our back. That's not how we're called to live as believers. We're called to live in today trusting that we will have the mercies and the compassions from God. And when we receive them, we then echo them out to others. Showing love to God and love to others. And that pattern, live day after day, will show to the world that we know Christ because of our love. Because of our love. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we spend some time of reflection They are new every morning, the mercies. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. We hope in Jesus because hope is Jesus. Where is your hope this morning? Is your hope in this, the things of this world? Are we looking for hope in our life circumstance, in our job, in our family, in finances, in physical objects? There is no hope in those things. There is only hope in Jesus. The other thing we saw this morning is love. It's the way we interact with others. A reflection of the hope that you have inside you. Do you love? In a way that puts others first above yourself. As the music plays softly, we're going to have a time of invitation. A time to respond to Jesus. To respond to the word of God that we've heard this morning. Do we hope? Do we love? If you could say, I've been struggling in how I've loved people. 
I've been struggling in what I put my hope in. Turn to Him. His mercies are new. His love is never failing. Believer, how have you been loving? How have you been hoping? And maybe today you could say, I've never hoped in Jesus. I've never experienced that salvation. Don't leave here today without understanding what it means to be saved. Come forward and we can show you from God's word how you can know him. How you can claim that hope. And you can live in that hope. Whatever God is speaking with you today, maybe you want to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe he's been calling you to unite with this church. To be part of this family as we continue forward to make followers of Jesus. Whatever God is speaking to you in your life, take this time now and pray to him. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for your mercies. It is in you and you alone that we hope in. We love you and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Look with me one more time, one more moment in verse 24. Before we leave, it says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. We hope in Jesus because Jesus is hope. Amen.